the mouse. I'm going to start by quoting James Williams, who says, the dynamics of the attention economy are structurally set up to undermine the human will. This is a quotation I'm taking completely on board for the purposes of this presentation. I'm not interested in arguing against this. So evidence suggests that James Williams is correct. Social media platforms are engineered to increase the likelihood that participants will stay on a site and continually scroll, keeping users in ludic loops, that is repetitive reward-seeking behavior, it's not a bug of social media design, it's a feature. It's a worry that makes it difficult for anyone in ethics to say that we meaningfully consent to using social media platforms. In this paper, I offer reasons for holding that we do not give meaningful informed consent to participating in social media. And I should forward again. I'm presuming a thin definition of informed consent for this paper. This is partly because I am not a scholar of informed consent and I am working on changing that state of affairs. So I'm presuming a thin definition of informed consent for this paper as decisionally capacitated users' voluntary and specific indication of agreement that must be based on a clear comprehension of what it is they are agreeing to. I do not merely mean that most of us who use Twitter neglect to read Twitter's terms of agreement, although that is also true. So I, I commend to you this article, does anyone read the fine print? The answer to the title question is one in 1,000. And I'm one of the 999 who don't. So I'm happy to say that I resemble almost all of the remarks I'm going to be making for the rest of this presentation. Rather, I mean that we cannot anticipate all the effects of abusive content online. And by abusive content, I'm going to be including things like shaming and harassment. I'll also just be including uh, many forms of insult and hate speech that don't amount to harassment. A abusive content is a really generous term that a lot of us in cyber ethics use. And the epistemic challenges to being truly informed about what online abuse is like are magnified by the efforts of social media platform designers to subvert our choice-making capacities to stop looking once we're online. There's little philosophical literature on consent as it relates to entering into and using social media. I'm going to pause again and add, I'm knitting together a lot of what I do say in this paper based on consent literature in bioethics and consent literature in the subfield of gambling, which I also expected to have more on consent, and it didn't, which is frustrating. So you all have much more work to do. Good. <laughs> And uh, I want greater resources for our discussions, but they're best found in psychology and the popular press. While some scholars and pundits lament that social media is hacking or hijacking our mind, and I do commend the hacking of the American mind and the Guardian article, Our Minds Can Be Hijacked. They're both very interesting reads. But in part one, I briefly outlined my reasons to agree with journalists and tech experts that Twitter and Facebook users are more appropriately analyzed, analogized with gamblers than with victims of hijacking. I mean, I think what we're doing is gambling with our, our autonomy and our wills. I should note, I do agree with these authors. Our minds are being hacked in the ways that they describe. But my focus on this paper is on whether we really consent to the terms of social media usage. So our gambles with our well-being are going to be of more interest to me. OK. So in part one, I'm going to be con discussing consent as a gamble. The subtitle of part one is I agree to the terms and conditions, whatever they are. In part two, I'm further concerned that seemingly consent-capable social media users cannot fully appreciate the stakes of the gambles that we take in social media. The examples that I focus on concern the negativity bias to which most humans are prone and which results in our remembering insults, hostility, and threats far more easily than compliments or kindness. Since philosophical literature on consent to social media is still young, I move to some justifiably pessimistic, I wanna say, and fruitfully frustrating, I hope, in conclusiveness regarding the extent to which consent in social media is an ethical problem that we can attenuate. Borrowing from bioethics literature in part three, I will contend that the badness of gambling with one's well-being in cyberspace may depend on consequentialist considerations, including risk-related standards of competence to consent. But it doesn't satisfy me. Our abilities to satisfy risk-related consent standards requires self-monitoring and anticipating the impact of negative experiences which may be undermined by our own online habituation and our desires to return to ludic loops of reward. As Williams points out, how would we know this hasn't already happened to us? And so I'll conclude that we cannot even be said to implicitly consent to participating in social media. Oh, and there I'll be pulling on consent to political arrangements, like consent to be governed, which again is not perfectly analogous, but it was what the literature offered me. 
So let's all work on this too. So part one is consent is a gamble, or I agree to the terms and conditions, whatever they are. Although the philosophical literature on consent and social media is still young, the software engineers of social media have raised their own articulate alarms regarding their own creations. As many of you know, this has been well covered in the press. For example, Justin Rosenstein compares Snapchat to heroin. Excellent. He compares Facebook likes to bright dings of pseudo pleasure that can be, as he says, as hollow as they are seductive. And journalist Paul Lewis adds, Rosenstein should know, he was the Facebook engineer who created the like button in the first place. Around the same time, the notification symbol was changed from blue to red. Facebook developers found that changing it to red resulted in far more engagement. And what they meant was the alarming color triggered more users' sense of urgency and reward. Twitter quickly copied the like function. They represent it with a heart-shaped symbol, which I just used today, so I know. Platform developers describe likes as a wildly successful innovation, possibly the most successful innovation in the social media landscape. But Rosenstein criticizes his own creation with concerns that it promoted psychological addiction, or at least habituation, among smartphone users who touch, swipe, or tap their phones 2,617 times a day. I think I have that number on a slide later, so you don't have to memorize it. Tristan Harris, a Google product manager, shares similar worries to Rosenstein's. He says, all of our minds can be hijacked. Our choices are not as free as we think they are. Harris provides the interviewer with the comparison of social media users to gamblers. He's not alone, James Williams does too. Specifically with respect to the ludic loops incurred by the pull to refresh mechanism. So if you have a smartphone you've ever pulled to refresh, I can explain it later if you like. The most seductive design, Harris explains, exploits the same psychological susceptibility that makes gambling so compulsive variable rewards. It's also called the slot machine effect by James Williams more often, so I commend Stand Out of Our Light for that. And I'm going to read this bit of Paul Lewis's interview with Tristan Harris at a bit more length. When we tap these apps with red icons, we don't know whether we'll discover an interesting email, an avalanche of likes, or nothing at all. So I hope you all understand what I mean by variable reward mechanisms. They render you more likely to become habituated to the ludic loop, that is the, um, the reaction of pleasure to getting a reward. That's the ludic loop. And uh, it's a reward-seeking behavior. But it's one that's best maintained if the rewards are variable. So you don't get a reward every time, right? When you pull to refresh, you might get an exciting news update. Or you might just get the news that your mother liked something you said, which is less exciting, right? Or you might get nothing at all. But uh, it's the variability that actually keeps people coming back and returning to the reward pattern. OK. Everybody understands what I mean by ludic loops. Why am I worried? I'm not teaching till tomorrow morning. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> All right, it's the possibility of disappointment that makes it so compulsive. So I'm going to repeat that again to make sure we're all on board. It's the possibility of disappointment that makes it so compulsive. It's this that explains how the pull to refresh mechanism, whereby users swipe down, pause, and wait to see what content appears, rapidly became one of the most addictive and ubiquitous de design features in modern technology. Each time you're swiping down, it's like a slot machine, Harris says. You don't know what's coming next. I'm saying that enthusiastically, but Tristan Harris was really worried about this by the time he's giving this interview. Rosenstein and Harris are describing the state of users who are already active on social media. And I want to pause here and say, if you think, is this some silver-haired Luddite who doesn't use it herself, I'm so thoroughly on social media, I, I am with you, my friends, in your habitual behavior. So I am criticizing something that I am a daily, and I would go so far as to say an hourly user of, except for this hour, where you're annoyingly keeping me from my smartphone. OK. So I'm going to add to Rosenstein's and Harris's observations that our initial entry into social media is like entering into a casino. It's voluntary in some ways, even if it's manipulatively rehabituated, as they describe. One may seek out company voluntarily. And the pro-social desires that inform the choice to enter social media are rather fundamental, as more than one psychologist has argued. It's pro-social. It's not entirely bad to want to enter social media. It includes the urges to be recognized by others, which we all share. But there are a multiplicity of ways to satisfy those urges, and firing up an app is only one of them. So I'm sensitive to those who say, you just shouldn't have social media in your life at all. I understand telling me I just shouldn't enter. I agree that decision-capable adults have the competence to consent, like we have the choice to ever start this at all. 
The problem is that although users may be competent to click the button that accepts the terms and conditions of Twitter, insofar as we have the requisite capacities <coughs> to consent, and the available option to choose not to enter, in the course of using the platform, our capacities become undermined by engineered ludic loops so that we do not always retain competence to consent in the course of performing the participation. We're not as free to leave as we are to enter because the variable rewards are constantly flowing to us in ways that alter some of the mental states that affect the very conditions for decision-capable consent. More than nudges, so I'm aware that this is a bit like nudge literature, but nudges manipulate preferences temporarily and can be done in paternalistic ways for good. What I'm describing as the ludic loops of social media platforms, they're designed to be mood altering and to have a high or constant event frequency. I'm not gonna go into this in as much detail today, but Natasha Dow Schull, who's an expert on digital gambling addiction, says um, high uh, event frequency correlates with addiction. I can talk about that more later. Moreover, once we're habituated to expect and anticipate ludic loops of variable reward, re-entry into social media on future occasions seems less transparently consensual than they may have been at first. One need not go so far as to agree that social media is addictive if it is sufficiently problematic for consent that our ability to form and know our preferences is altered by those who engineer social media to degrade our attention spans and motivate our preference for the sorts of ludic loops that social media provides. There's a growing literature arguing that social media users demonstrate behavioral addiction. I'm not gonna be defending the addiction square too much today because I think it's bad enough that we're highly habituated. We don't have to be addicted. But I wanna add that even uh, physiological addicts uh, arguably have autonomy in a general sense. So Neil Levy would argue at worst, addicts are subject to impairments of autonomy at times when they encounter cues that trigger their cravings. But Levy would add, for the great majority of the time, addicts are as autonomous as you and me, to an extent that preserves their capacities for informed consent. So I have a friend who is an alcoholic, but you know, when, the, when this friend is not around the uh, triggering cues that des motivate a desire for alcohol, they can consent to a flu shot. Uh, they can consent to being taped for a talk when they're not around the cues that trigger their desire for this habit. To retain that consent-enabling autonomy, Levy points out, an addict or anyone without addiction but with a persistent desire, and I think I would count as someone who's not addicted but has a persistent desire, needs simply turn attention away from the cues that trigger desires. Levy adds, addicts find this technique difficult to employ since the cues that trigger their cravings tend to capture their attention. However, they could take steps to avoid encountering the cues in the first place. That's the last quote. He suggests that avoiding the cues may involve avoiding the context that one associates with the persistent desire or addiction. And this is great news for those of us who can arrange our lives to avoid contexts we associate with some kinds of persistent desire. Unfortunately for social media users accustomed to ludic loops of reward, the triggering contexts associated with reward are those of starting up your computer or using your smartphone. I mean, what I'm saying is the triggering contexts for this are so ubiquitous for many of us in our day-to-day -day lives. I use my smartphone as an alarm clock because my old digital alarm clock broke. I use it to time when I end my classes. Okay, you're with me. In this essay, <laughs> I aim to attend to social media users in particular and not conflate the use of social media with the use of smartphones generally. But here the relationship between them is important. To the extent that we become dependent upon computers and smartphones, we become subject to ego depleting triggers to pop open a new tab in Chrome or tap the Facebook app on the iPhone. That's why I should forward. All right, so let's start part two the unknowable risks of social media and our own negativity biases. And I did want to excerpt because after, long after I, I impatiently clicked through the terms of agreement to Twitter so that I could access the platform and start tweeting, long after doing that, I read the actual terms of service in which they say, you understand that by using the services, you may be exposed to content that might be offensive. It, it can be harmful, it can harm you. And it can be inaccurate. We can't take responsibility for such content. And I clicked, I agree, uh, without actually ever reading this. Afterwards, friends of mine who um, encountered abuse online said, I really feel like my use of Twitter has actually harmed me. It's like, oh, Twitter agrees. They do think you've been harmed. Mm -hmm. They're not responsible for that content. All right. I indicated above that according to some of their own employees, social media platforms are engineered to undermine our capacities to consent while participating in Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat, even if we can be said to consent in advance. 
And this section, I want to develop my further worry that we may not be able to meaningfully consent in advance either if informed consent requires understanding the risks to our well-being inherent in social media. I'm especially interested in the risks we face as humans prone to negativity bias, that is, the selective attention of the brain to negative information and the capacity to remember one insult better than multiple compliments. I'm drawing on L.A. Paul's account of epistemic transformative experience, and I argue we cannot know in advance what it is like to experience the types and amount of anonymous insults or targeted hostilities and their effects that social media permits. I'm gonna pause again and say, of course you may know people who have experienced and so they have told you what it is like for them. So for this section, I'm going to be arguing that hearing what it is like for someone else is still not the same as knowing what it is like to experience online abuse yourself. Research in psychology indicates that we also cannot know in advance if we're dispositionally more or less likely to find that the negativity to which we're exposed has high enduring impact or low brief impact on our psyches. Like you cannot know in advance if this is gonna have enduring high impact or low brief impact on you. So social media negativity may also be a personally transformative experience. Therefore, even when we enter in eagerly into social media, I argue that we cannot meaningfully consent in advance to the gambles that we take with our mental well-being. So recall that smartphone users, oh, there, there's, there's the number, touch their phones 2,000, oh, sorry, touches her phone, 2,617 times each day on average. This is a study by Descoot from 2016. I, I suspect that the number is actually much higher, although they had a pretty generously wide sample. I think it was 2,000 people. Apple recently confirmed that its device users unlock their phones 80 times every day, so five times every waking hour on average. Smartphone users may scatter replies, comments, or judgments across more than one target and across more than one platform, but the same users are also the potential targets of the replies and judgments of fellow users. They're inundated with sensory and emotional inputs. One cannot know in advance when one will be the subject of others' online attentions. And once in our memories, the negativity bias to which almost all humans are prone will incline us to return to insults far more often than any compliment. So those familiar with the Stroop effect, which I suspect is a number of the people in this room, that is our selective attention in the presence of conflicting cognitive stimuli. We'll understand that just as it's difficult to read a word for a color and perceive the ink's color with equal speed, so the tint of that font is not the same as the word, it's also difficult for the brain to give insults and compliments equal weight. Let's click again. And this isn't always bad. We are set up to be jarred by insult, sorry, jarred. We are set up to be jarred by insults. One doesn't want to remember everything. It would be a huge cognitive load to no end, so it's not always bad to remember some things and not others. It's adaptive to do so. As a result, we're more inclined to process some information and hold on to it. But once insults move in, they take up residence in our memories, and our memories are not under our controls, would that they were. So on my slide, you can imagine which uh, feedback about my class I remembered. <laughs> and which most of the feedback I got about this class in particular was like three of the things on this slide. And only one of the feedback forms said the one thing on the slide that I remembered well. I had to actually dig back and find out what other students said. I couldn't believe how many of them were positive. It's like, oh, it was only one. I actually thought I'd find two or three in the class I was looking for. Not that you've ever had this experience. All right. <laughs> Note that I'm not describing the occupation of one's minds by insults as a risk on the part of social media addicts. One need not be addicted to anything to be subject to the Stroop effect, merely habituated to reading, and users of social media are habituated to reading. The mental occupation I describe bears a relation to what Laurie Paul describes as a transformative experience insofar as it is not possible to rationally predict whether or not one will prefer to be so mentally arranged. So for Paul, experiences are transformative when those of us who have not yet had the experience cannot fully appreciate what is rational for the transformed agent given changes to desires and deliberations that are results of the experiences one can only know post-transformation. Not all social media users find that the effects on one's mental states are enduring, and the impact can vary with unknown qualities of individual minds. That very unpredictability of effect and the unknown qualities of your mind suggests that the Stroop effect of online abuse is related to what Paul says regarding epistemic transformative experiences when she says, you cannot know what it will be like to have the experience before you have it yourself. 
This poses a problem for rational choice. We want our rational choices to be informed. She says, in this sort of situation, you know very little about your possible future. And so if you want to make the decision by thinking about what your lived experience would be like if you decided to undergo the experience, in this case of uh, social media abuse, then you have a problem. In such a situation, you find yourself facing a decision where you lack the information you need to make the decision you would naturally want to, the way that you naturally want to make it by assessing what the different possibilities would be like and choosing between them. I'm gonna suggest that none of us assessed what the possibilities would be like when we impatiently click through the terms of agreement on social media platforms. So I'm extending Paul's insight into situations in which one knows that one's choices can incur personally altering effects in order to argue that even when one does not know that entering into social media takes the risk of epistemically transformative experiences, encounters with unpredictable insult or verbal abuse also may not turn out to be tra personally transformative or at least negative and formative in ways one would not have chosen. So uh, in the longer version of this paper, I do dial back from personally transformative to say they can at least be negatively formative experiences. And I'm thinking here of friends of mine whose um, attitudes toward fellow philosophers, whose attitudes toward political change, whose attitudes toward people they thought they knew are altered by their experience of online abuse, especially between philosophers. Lori Paul says regarding personally transformative experiences that they relate to experiences that affect changes in who one takes oneself to be post-transformation. Again, one cannot know in advance of the experience how it will fundamentally change one's point of view or the value-laden preferences that previously constituted one's own view of one's character, or I'm gonna add in light of the philosophers I'm thinking of, one's view of other people's characters the, and your relationship to them and who you thought you were in that relationship. She adds that experiences may be epistemically transformative, personally transformative, or both. I extend her view to less transformative but negatively formative experiences because we cannot know what it feels like in advance to receive online abuse, to witness it toward our friends, and we cannot know if it will live in our memories. Typical human disposition to negativity bias entails that most of us take a risk with our mental well-being, or at least our emotional attention when we participate in a world wide web of unpredictable users of words. And it's only a risk. The formative experience of online abuse is not inevitably personally transformative. I've witnessed some social media users frankly marvel at their reception of abusive content on the very platforms in which they experience it. Right? So the way I know that some of my friends have had personally negatively formative experiences uh, with online abuse is they tell me so online. They, they tell the world online. And they don't report any permanent alterations in their core preferences, values, or their self-conceptions. I'm gonna add again, they don't report any permanent alterations. But that's gonna be my out for later in this paper. However, some users indeed report actual changes to their personality over time as a result of online abuse, especially as they come to realize how they are perceived from the perspectives of their insulters, that is, their imagined audience. So this includes uh, studies I've read in which people say things like, my friends really think that I've changed since I started using social media. I'm including the comment of a friend of mine who cannot wear a beloved sweater that was insulted when my friend appeared on television. Uh, and so cannot wear that sweater anymore. Like her fundamental preferences for what she thought was her favorite article of clothing have changed. Yeah, it's sad, it's sad, right? Can't even wear your favorite sweater. Media researcher Eden Litt adds that the imagined audience is always moving in before one knows it. The numbers of potential replies to one's tweets or comments are so vast that one must rely on one's imagination even more than if one's readers were knowable. So you could argue, don't we take the same risks when we teach a class? And I wanna say, even in a class of 100 students, at least my 100 students are knowable. And the imagined audience of the vast <coughs> indefinite quantities of unknowable comments and uh, anonymous comments are much harder to manage. Lit points to evidence that we are constituted to mentally conceptualize those with whom we communicate. And of course, that's good. It's how you're able to write an email or plan a lecture or a syllabus. So I suggest that cyberspace is a problem because it presents possibly insurmountable challenges to our capacities to control those conceptualizations as the speed and volume of online affirmation and deformation outmatches what the human mind evolved to manage. I contend that regardless of Twitter's terms of agreement, no one can meaningfully consent in advance to harmful content online. 
Because the experience of encountering abusive speech is unpredictable and the duration of its impact is only discoverable through experience. So I'm going to move on to part three. I will inflict uh, fewer text-filled slides upon you now. So part three is called Two Cheers for Risk-Related Standards of Consent. Although I am seriously concerned about persons for whom the effects of negativity bias are profound and long-lasting, and for some it is, as well as impossible to appreciate in advance, those are not all persons. Indeed, most users of social media likely relate to the experience of being occupied by encounters with temporarily mood-altering insult or negativity online, but also return to social media shortly thereafter. Some users with limited social networks, excellent online conduct, advantageous social privileges, or just good luck may never experience epistemically transformative abuse online. One may only look at pictures of dogs and friends and avoid all distress. And I would put my mother in that category. She largely looks at pictures of dogs and friends. Although she did see someone insult me, that was very upsetting to her for a little while. But that's okay. I'm fine with it. All right. If so, then is the lack of meaningful informed consent to a social media platform really an ethical problem? If, if a lot of users can just look at dogs and friends, uh, do I really have a problem? Is this really a project worth doing? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Surprise. All right. If it is less serious of a problem when the actual effects are not harmful for most users, then it makes sense, at least in principle, to adhere to risk-related standards of competence to consent, as described by Alan Buchanan and Dan Brock. There's my friends. Briefly, they argue, the appropriate level of competence properly required for a particular decision must be adjusted to the consequences of acting on that decision, and the consequences include, they say, the expected effects of the chosen activity. But you see my emerging problem. When the expected effects of an act are mostly harmless, and I think we could say, if we generalize, if we just say generally most people only look at dogs and friends, then the expected effects generally are mostly harmless. We could say that. And then the standards for competence to consent can be lowered without great danger. Rather than recommending written terms of agreement that convey to Twitter users what epistemic transformations may recur as a result of online abuse, because I did start thinking, Perhaps Twitter should just beef up its terms of agreement. I thought, no, I still wouldn't read them. So instead, ethicists could just agree that the level of competence to judge necessary for consent to Twitter or Facebook, it's reduced in correlation with the low risk of harm for most in social media. In other words, if we insouciantly click the I consent box, because for most of us, social media really is a pleasant pastime with a low incidence of actual harm then the standards of whether we're competent to understand the risks to our psychological well-being can be less demanding than if the incidence rates of functionality impacting harm are worse than we suppose. This is a promising perspective on consent with respect to such a leisurely pastime, and it may be justified in part by pointing to users who have experienced online abuse or insult, yet return to social media eventually, either sooner or later. And a lot of my friends do that. They experience online abuse, and then they return. So can pointing to those friends of mine obviate this problem? I'm going to say no. However, although the risk-related standards seem quite correct in principle, the very features of social media that undermine our wills while we are online complicate our veracity with respect to our claims to be unharmed or troubled in any transformative way. The capacities of habituated users to assess whether they're returning to social media because the benefits outweigh the risks to their mental health are undermined by their very use of social media. And I know I just said my friend's epistemic authority has been undermined, and I look forward to talking about with them later. Perhaps we shouldn't put this online. Thank you in advance. <laughs> All right, let me, let me forward to a conclusion. Social media participation, I'm going to be arguing in my conclusion, does not even indicate implicit consent. So I want to add, of course, perhaps one wants to return to social media. If people are just trying to have fun or avoid looking at each other at the bus stop, which often is just the overriding priority. You know, I know my will is being undermined, and I know I'm giving over my data to Big Brother, but I just want to avoid looking at people at the bus stop. If that's all one wants to do, if the risks of harm are low, then perhaps participants in social media do not care that we give over forced consent. That is, consent bundled with access to social media platforms. Although I will say there are active lawsuits in the EU right now <laughs> arguing that we shouldn't be required to give forced consent, that consent should not be bundled with access. 
Those aren't succeeding though, so I get to read this paper. One may even argue that participants in social media could be said to implicitly consent to will undermining practices of social media. Our very participation in such activities as Twitter and Facebook, in conjunction with our broader knowledge of the nature of online communication, might indicate we're all performing acts of implicit consent in using social media platforms. More than one philosopher has suggested, oh good, he's in the middle, that criticism and even insult is to be expected online. And we all know what we're getting into. And we should simply be, oh, this is my edition, because he didn't say this, better educated or very resigned <laughs> adults. My response is based on our limited freedom to change our context or to leave social media. As Nicola Malaberti says, a political consent. And I do appreciate that political consent is not perfectly parallel to cyber ethics consent, but it was the literature available to me. Malaberti says, for an act of consent to count as such, there must be something that is possible to do which counts as refusing to consent. While it is true that one could refuse to participate in social media, it also seems to be the case that leaving social media has costs for some more than others to such an extent that a blanket recommendation to refuse to participate is not practical or supportive of one's autonomy in other ways. Maloberti similarly notes that, of course, leaving a state is possible, but for some more costly than others. He cites David Hume, my friend, who questioned how realistic it is to consider the option to emigrate as an available alternative for individuals to whom the prospects of emigrating would be clearly undesirable. In addition to my concern, given the evidence that our wills are undermined with respect to freely considering emigration from social media, I share a worry analogous to Hume's and Maloberti's. I do not believe that everyone equally enjoys the absence of cost if they leave social media. My cost, however, would be low. I am an established tenured professor. I will never need to look for a job again. I cannot be fired without cause, and I am blessed with a partner and a large extended family. Those who are still struggling, still networking, or socially isolated cannot leave social media as easily as I can. So the acts we tend to think of as counting as refusing to consent to social media, such as deleting accounts from social networking sites or taking a holiday from the internet, are not equally available to all and they're not equally trivial to all. When I take a holiday, everybody says, we'll miss you, come back. Mm -hmm. And when my underemployed adjunct takes a holiday from social media, people to ask him, uh, how will I get a hold of you given your changing emails and your adjunct status when I want to tell you about a job ad? Right? So this is not equally free cost for everybody. Uneven options to leave do not seem sufficient to Malaberti's ethical demand that for an act of consent to count as such, there must be something that is possible to do which counts as refusing to consent for the many. Further, implied consent relies on assumptions that the activity permitting the inference of explicit consent is voluntary. Malaberti offers the example of one who goes to a restaurant and orders a meal as implicitly consenting to the expectation that he paid for it. I love that. The customer need not go with the intention of ordering food in order to spend money, like the intention to spend money doesn't have to be your goal in going to a restaurant. His intention may only be to satisfy a yen for lasagna, but we can fairly hold the customer to make the choice to go to the restaurant and place the order by choice uh, and to pay for it as a result of his choices. I'm suggesting in this essay that many individuals' participation in social media cannot be described the same way. If I have been persuasive, and since we're about to enter the q and I'll find out how wrong I am, but if I have been persuasive, then it should be clear that social media cultivates our thoughtlessness, and successfully so. The will to enter social media may be sincere, and it may be motivated by reasons both affective and considered. But the habituation of persons to turn to social media and return to social media before they even realize that they have done so gives us reason to think that the impulsive reaction to a Facebook or Snapchat post is not the same as choosing to go to a restaurant. I noted earlier that as Natasha Dauschul says, event frequency correlates with addiction. I hope I have shown that social media participation provides the possibilities for indefinite event frequency on a platform so proximate that it is difficult to track. If implicit consent to social media entails voluntarily choosing to engage, then we are not even implicitly consenting to participate this frequently. If we cannot even be said to implicitly consent to our continual return to ludic loops of reward, then social media undermines our autonomy. Thank you.